Good afternoon and welcome to the Gospel Loft today. We're going to do something that is um, maybe a bit controversial today again. Um, we want to talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel. In my introduction, I, I wrote when I first was confronted with the different interpretations of the book of Daniel, I researched first who has brought about what and what is the origin of the different interpretations. It was Pastor Eric Wilson, whom I met in the mid-70s, who first woke me up to the fact that there are different interpretations. And later I had a Bible teacher called um, Pastor Edwin Thomas, a oh, beautiful expositor of the scripture. Um, great standing he had with the Lord. And he put the lid on the issue for me. And then my good friend Johann Ross confirmed my path of direction and he was able to fill a few holes that were missing for me. Now, the first question I was confronted with, would you rather believe men like Luther, Swingley, Calvin, John Huss, Bunyan, Ridley, Latimer, Newton, Spurgeon, Grattan, Guinness, F.B. Mayer, Campbell, Morgan, the Wesley brothers, or to unknown Jesuits by the name of Ribiera and La Concia? That's the question. Who would you go with if you want to know something? I, I, I always say go with the people that have some standing in theological circles. Yeah, and we know who it is in this case. Now my theological mind will place my faith in the reformers as never anything good has come out of any Jesuit's mouth. Now this Catholic order has the top priority to defend Rome and the popes at all costs. If God says white and the Pope says black, then the Jesuits will go with black and not with white and not with God. Having said this, I'd like to continue in saying that the General Christian Fellowship has no idea concerning the depth of the difference between the two major interpretations. The one thought gives the central figure the identity of the Antichrist, while the other gives the place, the same place, to Jesus Christ. Now, this is how fundamental this issue is and how different the two um, interpretations are. Daniel 70 weeks is the only prophecy that actually foretells the first coming of the Messiah. Up to the 16th century, we find no split in this interpretation and everybody was of the same mind, even the Catholic Church. The problem arose when the reformers were pointing their finger at the Vatican as the Antichrist system or dynasty. They, of course, had good reasons for this because of the great persecution. Millions of Waldenses and Albigenses and Huguenots and other reformed communities were haunted to death by Rome. Here again, I would like to recommend read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Let us then go to the actual text of dispute in Daniel chapter 9. So we have Daniel 9 verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, first something about my people and geography. In this instance, Daniel speaks very clearly about the house of Judah and about Jerusalem. There is nothing spiritual about the beginning of the verse. Daniel does not speak of the ten tribed house of Israel because only 50,000 from Babylonian captivity has returned to the land and hardly any 
out of the Assyrian captivity. And then something about biblical time interpretation. The Bible gives us three basic interpretations for this. One day for one day, or one year for one year. The best example we find in Jeremiah, when he speaks about the 70-year captivity for the house of Judah. In Jeremiah 25, verses 11 to 12. Now, this time measure is used for relative short periods of time within a lifespan of a human life or a human person. And then we have one year or one day for one year. This time measure we glean from Numbers 14 and verse 34 and from Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. And it is used within the time span of a particular dispensation or a part of biblical history concerning a prolonged prophecy. We find many such examples also in the book of Revelation, taking the historicist view, of course. And as we read about 42 months, we take about um, 150 days or three and a half years or 1260 days and so forth. And then we have one day as a thousand years. Here the people, the, the Bible speaks of creational times and often refers to God's far-reaching plans, even into eternity. We, we use uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 8 for this. In our text, we use one day for one year, and most scholars agree on this. In other words, we have 400 year, 490 year days. Uh, both sides of the argument agree on this point. Then we come to the identification of the central figure. Now, who does Daniel speak about is the question in verse 24. Now, we just put a few questions here. He said, who finished transgression? It is Jesus Christ in respect of his first coming and definitely not an antichrist. Who makes reconciliation for iniquity? It would be difficult to take this away from the Lord Jesus, <coughs> as it was him who has dealt with the burden of sin, now, who has brought in everlasting righteousness. Jesus has fulfilled every law concerning himself and every law part of the law of righteousness. Who has sealed vision and prophecy? Now, since Jesus seems to be the center of most prophecies in one way or another, it would be difficult for someone else to fulfill his shoes or to fill his shoes. It is impossible to point finger to anybody else. I have difficulties in believing that <coughs> anyone with a measure of biblical understanding would have different views on this matter. We cannot allot any of this to a future Antichrist. Yet millions of people have fallen into a trap that was set by some Jesuit priest. It is one of the strongest spiritual delusions ever getting into the church. Then the last question referring to verse 24, who was anointed? There was one who was anointed by the Holy Spirit at the Jordan River some 2000 years ago. It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. A voice was heard from heaven declaring his position. <coughs> then we come to verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Here we have no difficulties at all in understanding it. From the going forth of the commandment is the first point. We need to get to a starting date for this and preferably from history itself. Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians, gave an order in 538 BC to rebuild um, the temple. But now it was Artaxerxes who gave out the decree to rebuild the city in 457 BC. 
We will therefore take the second day because it refers to the city of Jerusalem and see if we can come up with a godly starting point. The calculation is simple. 457 BC plus 7 weeks, 49 years, plus 62 weeks, 434 years is the calculation. With this we get to the year 27 AD, which brings us to Jesus' messianic calling and anointing. And thus far it is quite simple. And then we come to verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. The time frame at the beginning is given to the Messiah, but Daniel takes the thought to the end of Jewish um, national existence. Here the debate begins in the second part of the verse, which we will open later. I just want to say again that I prefer to take sides with people of repute, as we have mentioned in the beginning, and not with two Jesuits, with a doubtful past. In this verse, Daniel speaks all the way to the event of 70 AD, when the Roman general Titus destroys Jerusalem and the temple. From there on, we have no more peace in that place at all. Let's read another verse to get a better picture. And that is verse 27. And he, in brackets, Messiah, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. See. Why I've put Messiah in the bracket where it says, and he, Messiah, shall confirm the covenant. Because um, there is no body that has ceased or made to cease the sacrifice and oblation except Jesus Christ at the cross. Here is the last week of the prophecy. In the middle of the week, three and a half years after the baptism of Jesus, he's put to the cross and to death. In this period, the new covenant, covenant is preached exclusively to the Jews, and after his resurrection, again the gospel is preached in Jerusalem and Judea for another three and a half years until the stoning of Stephen. From there onward, it went to the Gentiles also. Nowhere in the Bible do we find a text where a covenant is going to be made with an antichrist. And again, it is Jesus who has made an end to the temple sacrifice and to oblation. He called out from the cross, it is finished. The prophecy is fulfilled and the world history carries on. I would like to add concerning the second half of verse 27, the following. In God's book, every animal sacrifice after the death of Jesus is an abomination. Makes no difference who does it. Jew or non-Jew, animal sacrifices have ceased and God takes no pleasure now or in any future in any such thing. Yes, any such, such act after 34 AD until 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, was making a mockery of the Lamb of God. The Jews carried on with this ritual until then. But finally, the Lord brought about the end of the place who had become an abomination in the sight of God. He has built a new temple made of lively stones called the Fellowship of the Saints. To build another temple before the coming of the Lord would be another abomination before the Lord and induce even more punishment. I would become, it would become the work of the synagogue of Satan as it would be a slap in God's face. I cannot understand that such thoughts could be entertained by believing Christians. And now we come to 
the opposition? Where does it come from? Why, why suddenly, after 1600 years, we have a different interpretation? During the Reformation, towards the end of the 16th century, the voice against the popes and the tyranny of Roman Catholicism became louder and louder. They all shouted, thou art the man of sin, the Antichrist. Yeah. When in the introduction to the King uh, James um, uh, translation uh, from 1611, um, the popes were accused of being the beast of Revelation chapter 13, quite openly, that man of sin, they call it in the introduction. Now, the reaction of the Vatican was imminent, and the Pope turned to the Jesuits with the order of finding a passage in the Bible that could point away from Rome. And they found the 70 weeks of Daniel and came up with a bent theology that would point to a future Antichrist and let the Pope off the hook. A Jesuit by the name of Ribera brought a new doctrine to the table in AD 1585, which placed the 70th week into a far future and so gave the central figure a new identity. This had an enormous ripple effect right through the book of Revelation and the accusing finger was turned away from the Vatican. Then a second Jesuit came onto the scene. His name was Lacunthia. He wrote a book on this new theology under a pseudonym of a Protestant convert of Jewish origin. It was an absolute genius and, and, and absolute great psychology. As soon as a converted Jew says something, the whole church eats it as if it was heavenly truth. The Pope then banned the book as heresy and the deception was complete. The book nevertheless got lost in the tumult of religious wars. And by the time peace was made between Catholics and the Protestants, all was forgotten. Much later in the 19th century, the librarian S.R. Maitland, under the Bishop of Canterbury, published the writings again. Now, it, it was where the founder of the Plymouth Brethren, um, J.N. Darby, picked up this new edition and incorporated it into his theology, this Jesuit interpretation. From there, it went like wildfire into the Baptist Church then into the Pentecostal fellowships, and of course to the charismatic movement and independent evangelicals. This futurist interpretation is today the most preached idea on the second coming of Christ and the book of Revelation. Seldom do we find anyone today holding to the traditional truth that was upheld from day one to the 16th century. And another point, it is bad exegesis to take a prophecy and interrupt its fulfillment with extended time gaps, like 2000 years in this instance, just because it does not suit my way of thinking. Nowhere in the Bible is prophecy treated that way. When we, uh, on, on top of that, ascribe the central person of Jesus Christ to an antichrist, it becomes blasphemy. As I mentioned earlier, this interpretation had also grave consequences in respect of the fulfillments of the historic, the historic fulfillments um, in the book of Revelation. From uh, uh, chapter 6 to 22, nothing would, be, would have happened. And on top of it, much of the time, the church would not even be present in their way of thinking. Why would the Lord give so many chapters of instructions if it does not affect his children? Now, what it does nevertheless is creating an opening to write hundreds of speculative books, how it will be one day. I remember that one of the first books that I was pushed down, uh, was pushed down my throat, was a book by Hal Lindsey, The Late Planet Earth. It is much more exciting 
to read such a utopia instead of studying the Word of God and apply proper tools for interpretation and read some honorable commentators about it. Man in general is too lazy to form an informed opinion and just runs with the flow and flavor of the day. Now the whole futuristic interpretation hangs on the single hinge in one verse of Daniel's prophecy. The question that I have to ask myself, is it Jesus Christ or is it Antichrist that the Bible speaks about in Daniel's prophecy? Then the question comes, is it a fulfillment of prophecy or a wide, misplaced and torn apart piece of writing? See, but the Pope had more help from the Jesuit in the person of a man called Alcazar, who presented in the year 1603 AD the Preterist interpretation, where all of the prophetic values were put into the first century. Again, its sole purpose was to absolve the popes and the Vatican from all guilt. Truth came not into play here. They couldn't give two hoots if it's true or not true. What they wanted to do is to absolve the pope from his guilt. The historicist view, which was held all the way up to the 16th century and further by the reformers until later by F.B. Meyer, Campbell Morgan and others, has been silenced. But what are the consequences that this interpretation brings with it? Now, this so-called favorite subject of the seven-year tribulation, and it is a favorite subject, would fall into the waste paper basket. It wouldn't, wouldn't apply anymore. There wouldn't be seven years of tribulation. And people have so much invested in time and effort that it is almost impossible for them to even consider anything else but the Jesuit interpretation. It also puts an end to a pre-trip rapture, which is another favorite. We Christians of today would then have um, to perhaps endure persecution, just like millions of others before us. Terrible thought that we would be disturbed in our comfort zone and not have the chance of being taken out at our convenient time. What arrogance this is towards the suffering Waldenses and Huguenots. Who do we think we are that we can just be raptured out of it without any little tribulation, just cruising on in the most comfortable life that we enjoy at the moment? The question is, is there a rapture? Of course is there a rapture. It is written. But Jesus is not going to come twice. Anybody that reads the Thessalonian text with open eyes, will see this. On this issue, in many of the more educated futurists, we can see a change of direction already, because it is impossible. Now, is there going to be a tribulation at the end before the coming of the, of the Lord? Of course there will be tribulation. There are so many texts written about it, and all to God's people. Why would the Lord write it to you because he does not want you to be ignorant and that you can prepare yourself for it. I know that tribulation with God is better than tribulation without God. He can and he will lend a hand during it. Now, there is one more portion that I would like to share. It's a bit of dubious thing because it was sent to me um, without great backing. It's called the rabbinic curse. What I would like to add is this strange stance that the Talmud takes on this issue. Because it is a prophecy that predicts the first coming of Christ and of course its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The rabbis have set themselves firmly against it. They, they didn't want the suffering Jesus to come. They even spoke a curse against all that would interpret Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. I, I cannot say how much truth is in this proclamation. I mention it just for interest's sake. But here is what someone has posted to me. It's, it's the curse. May the bones 
of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose, of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find the time of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and may his memory rot from the face of the earth forever. And in brackets, the, 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 the reference was Talmudic Law, page 978, section 2, and line 28. This is what I got. But what I, th I thought is, it sounds like the fear religion of Islam, or Roman Catholicism, or made up by the synagogue of Satan. Now, if the Jewish theology has to go this far to prevent the truth, from being proclaimed, we can presume that something in the text refers to Jesus and not to an Antichrist, who is the figment of some Jesuits' imagination. Think about it, read about it, and see who you want to believe. The reformers, the theologians of repute, or to Jesuits who want to protect the Pope. God bless you. Amen.